Welcome and a good time of day to you. I'm sure most of you know what this is. My task is to try to do something to improve the quality of the television picture produced by this ZX81. The RF video output of the computer is connected to this television. The computer and television are switched on, the latter is correctly tuned, and its other settings are as I usually have them when using a ZX Spectrum. Unfortunately, we can't see much other than hints of reflections of things in this room. However, if I turn up the television's brightness, the ZX81's display becomes visible. The quality of the picture isn't especially poor, but having to adjust the brightness just for the ZX81 is annoying, and the underlying cause of this problem means that some televisions will refuse to produce a picture, no matter how their brightness control is set. As with the ZX Spectrum, some improvement of the picture can be achieved by disconnecting the computer's RF modulator and connecting what was the modulator's input directly to the composite video input of a television or monitor. In the ZX81's case, this implies connecting the ULA's video output directly to the television. Sadly, this won't remove the need to turn the brightness almost all the way up. Let's look at part of what should be an ideal composite video waveform to feed to a television or monitor. Strictly, this is a luminance video signal, not a composite one. It contains no colour information, but since the ZX81 does not produce a colour picture, this is all we need concern ourselves with. The green line shows how the luminance signal varies over a brief period of time as the electron beam of the television begins to draw a single horizontal line of the picture, sweeping from left to right as it does so. Of course, modern LCD and similar televisions don't generate a picture in quite the same way, but they can reconstitute a full picture from a signal like this. After a very short period at zero volts, called the front porch, the signal drops to minus 300 millivolts for a time before returning to zero volts. This negative going line synchronization pulse notifies the television a new horizontal scan line is about to begin. After another period at zero volts, the back porch, the signal begins to vary between 0 volts and 700 millivolts to indicate the intensity at each point on the line as the electron beam makes its way across the screen. Once the whole line has been described, another synchronization pulse with its surrounding porches indicates the start of the next line down. Multiple synchronization pulses are sent one after another when a whole frame of the picture has been completed and it's time to start the next one from the top left. The way the ZX81 indicates this event doesn't fully comply with the PAL specification, but it's usually good enough and we shouldn't need to make any changes to it. Nor need we worry about any complexities arising from the interlaced nature of a PAL display. I've not been able to find a definitive statement about how long line synchronization pulses and the zero volt periods either side of them should last. Examining the video output produced by a number of devices, I found line synchronization pulses are typically between 4 and 6 microseconds long, and the following back porch is commonly 4 to 10 microseconds in duration. Fortunately, most televisions produce a proper picture, so long as these features have durations in or close to these ranges. Because each character dot produced by the ZX81 can only be black or white, the picture data part of the waveform steps sharply between the voltages that represent these two states, 0 volts being black, or the darkest shade the display is capable of, and 700 millivolts white, the maximum intensity possible. The example here represents a picture line whose left hand part is white with three equally spaced black dots. When a UHF carrier is amplitude modulated by a composite video signal and transmitted through the air to a receiving aerial, as was the case when analog broadcast television was operating, the amplitude and DC offset of the original signal are not preserved following demodulation inside the television. Circuitry is usually present to automatically adjust these parameters to suit whatever processing the television must perform to generate a picture. Because of this, within reason, most televisions happily accept a composite input with an amplitude or offset other than that shown here. It's usually far more important that the amplitudes of their various elements are in correct proportion to each other than it is that the overall amplitude closely matches some specification. Nevertheless, most televisions that have a composite video input expect it to be approximately as shown in this graph. 
Because of the increased complexity of generating negative voltages in devices that have no negative power supply rail, it's usually acceptable to offset the composite signal so that line synchronization is indicated by zero volts. This is what we'd like to see come out of the ZX81. To make the video signal slightly more interesting, I'm running this simple program to fill the screen with the chessboard pattern graphic character. Here's the signal at the input to the ZX81's video modulator displayed on an oscilloscope. The vertical scale is 1 volt per division and the 0 volt level is indicated by the small marker on the left. The overall signal amplitude is about 4 volts peak to peak, with the white level at 4 volts and the line synchronization pulse descending all the way to 0 volts. The black level is at approximately 3 volts, as evidenced by the lower limit of the picture data. The excessive overall amplitude probably doesn't cause much of a problem. However, the amplitude of the synchronization pulse is massively out of proportion, and worse still, is not followed by a back porch. The voltage immediately shoots up to the white level, rather than pausing for a while at the black level. This is a serious problem, because the television uses the back porch to determine the voltage that should represent black. With this signal, the television will mistakenly conclude this is about 4 volts, the same as the white level. This results in a picture with approximately no contrast, and so the brightness has to be turned all the way up before it can be seen. Later versions of the ZX81 ULA do generate a back porch, and so the circuits I'm about to present probably won't be of much benefit if used with them, though they should adjust the proportions of the waveform to be more reasonable. In this case, the back porch generating components could be omitted, leaving a very simple circuit indeed. This signal has no front porch either, Fortunately, the vast majority of televisions don't care about this. I imagine the purpose of a front porch is to allow a very simple synchronization detection circuit in some televisions to settle to a stable state prior to the synchronization pulse, and so make sure it's reliably detected. I've designed a circuit that should remedy some of these problems, and I'll introduce it stage by stage. The ULA's video output is connected directly to the base of transistor Q1. The signal at Q1's emitter follows its input, but is reduced by the forward voltage drop of the base emitter junction. This has the effect of shifting the waveform down slightly, cutting off the bottoms of the synchronization pulses, and so bringing their amplitude a bit closer to what it should be. The resistance labelled R display represents the 75 ohm input impedance of the television or monitor. It forms a potential divider with R4 attenuating the video signal. This probably isn't essential, however R4 limits the current through Q1 should the output be short-circuited, and is necessary for another reason that should soon become apparent. The forward voltage drop of diodes D1 and D2 further shift the video waveform downwards, cutting more off the bottoms of the synchronization pulses, leaving a signal with an amplitude of about 1 volt peak to peak. In the case of a ZX81 with a ULA that generates a video signal with back porches, the circuit as shown now could be used to make it very similar to the ideal signal, however many televisions will produce a reasonable picture when fed directly from such a ULA. If the video signal has no back porch following each synchronization pulse, then these must be added if a proper picture is to be produced. The complementary Darlington formed of Q2 and Q3 is equivalent to a single, very high gain NPN transistor. If this is switched on for a period immediately following a line synchronization pulse, the output which would otherwise be at the white level gets pulled down to about 300 millivolts. So, if I can arrange for this transistor pair to be turned on at the right times, a back porch can be added after each synchronization pulse. To set the duration of the back porch, I've used a standard two-transistor monostable circuit. Normally Q5 is off, Q6 on, and capacitor C2 discharged. If an external signal should briefly pull the voltage at Q5's base, above approximately 0.6 of a volt, it will switch on, causing the voltage on both sides of C2 to be pulled down to about 0 volts. This forces Q6 off, and the voltage at its collector is pulled up to 5 volts by R5. This is applied to Q5's base via R8, making sure it stays switched on, even if the external trigger has been removed. 
This situation, however, cannot last. C2 charges via R6 and Q5, causing a rising voltage on its left-hand side. Soon this switches Q6 on again. The voltage at its collector is pulled down, close to zero volts, and this forces Q5 to turn off. C2 discharges via R7, and the circuit waits to be triggered again. The length of time the circuit spends in the unstable state when it's triggered is set by the combination of C2 and R6. Q6's collector is connected to Q2's base to cause the video signal at the output to be pulled down during this time. I've used the very high gain combination of Q2 and Q3 because I found that if Q2's base current is not minuscule, operation of the monostable circuit is disturbed. I suspect it to be possible to refine the design so that only a single NPN transistor is required in place of Q2 and Q3. Finally, a means of triggering the monostable at the correct times is needed. This is done by transistor Q4. The voltage at the video output is high enough to hold Q4 on at all times other than during a line synchronization pulse, though the black level voltage during the picture data portion of the waveform is barely high enough to keep Q4 on. As soon as a synchronization pulse arrives, Q4 switches off and the voltage at Q5's base is pulled up via R9 and R1, triggering the monostable. This circuit is rather finely balanced, and I suspect small changes in component characteristics could cause it to malfunction. Nevertheless, I've assembled it on a breadboard, and it results in a good, high contrast picture on my television. Here, the circuit's output, as captured by an oscilloscope, is shown in yellow. The upper blue trace is its input from the ZX81's ULA. Note the different vertical scales. The output is shown at 500 millivolts per division, and the input, 2 volts per division. The circuit produces a 5 microsecond long back porch following each synchronization pulse. The result is very close to the ideal luminance signal. Here's another example of the circuit's output, while the ZX81 displays an all white picture. The upper blue trace is the output of the monostable at Q6's collector. Because I fear this circuit might have some reliability problems, and it might prove tricky to assemble it on a piece of stripboard small enough to fit inside the metal can in place of the ZX81's RF modulator circuit, I've devised a simpler version. Q1, R4, D1 and D2 operate exactly as before. Q2, when switched on, pulls down the output voltage to create a back porch. The two-transistor monostable circuit is replaced by a 555 timer in the standard monostable configuration. Its output can supply more than enough current to Q2, and so only a single transistor is needed here. Capacitor C4 speeds up the turn off of Q2 at the end of each back porch, causing the output to rise sharply to the white level voltage that represents the picture's white border. The resulting picture will probably be just as good if C4 is omitted, though I prefer to include it. The 555 monostable's input, pin 2, should normally be held high, with the low voltage pulse needed to trigger it. Connecting the ULA's video output directly to this pin works well, causing the monostable to trigger only when a synchronization pulse arrives. The back porch duration is set by the combination of C3 and R1. When tested on a breadboard, I found the intercontact capacitance was so high the circuit worked well with C3 omitted. However, the values shown are the ones I went on to use to assemble the circuit on a small piece of stripboard. A document containing both of the circuit diagrams I've presented and the stripboard layout for the second circuit can be downloaded at the website zx.zigg.net. Note that R2 and C4 are mounted on top of each other through the same holes on the stripboard. Here's the output of the 555 based circuit in yellow. The upper blue trace shows the output of the 555 monostable. This is a slightly longer portion of the circuit's output, showing several scan lines. It almost exactly matches the ideal luminance waveform. Finally, I'll leave you with some ZX81-based acts of sabotage. <laughs>